thank you so much for logging on to join us. This is our webinar about how social media affects your child and what we can do about it. Um, give us a minute here. We're just trying to get our hosts in the right setting here. Hi guys, this is Matt. Uh, not able to start my video. It says the host has disabled video. Same with me. Me as well. This is Maria. Uh, okay. Let me try and figure this stuff out. Sorry, guys. No worries. So luckily everyone can see me, you guys. So at least we have one face here. Why don't you start? Lindsay, start. <laughs> okay. So Dr. Beal, um, are you able to share your screen? No. <laughs> okay. There we go. There we go. All right. So we can hear you. We can see the screen. Let's get started with uh, kicking off um, this discussion. And oh, Dr. Kopowitz, I see you. Um, I'm here. And Lindsay, I'm I'm happy to do the introduction. I just we'll do it with our Perfect. Feet. Thank you. Go ahead. We can hear you. Oh, and there we see Dr. Mar or Maria. We see you as well. We're getting Yay, I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm I'm happy to 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 kick us off with our video. Uh, really grateful for uh, our participants joining this evening. Uh, it's a it's a important and timely topic, and so it's not surprising to see so much interest. Uh, we're going to be speaking this evening about how social media affects your child and what you can do to help. My name is Dr. Matt Beal. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I'm the chief of the Division of Child Psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical Center, where I'm professor of psychiatry and pediatrics. I'm also the chief medical officer for Fort Health, and I'm joined here by several terrific colleagues. I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves. Uh, Lindsay, why don't I pass to you? Thank you, Matt. So my name is Dr. Lindsay Henderson. I am a psychologist, a child and adolescent psychologist. We see you, Matt. Your name looks like Harold Kopowitz. Two Heralds are better than none, so let's we'll take it. Um, I am a clinical psychologist and a clinical director for Fort Health. And I'm Harold Koplowitz. I'm the president and the founding medical director of the Child Mind Institute, uh, which is an independent nonprofit dedicated to transforming the lives of children and families who struggle with mental health and learning disorders, and a very proud partner of Ford Health. And I'm delighted that people could mix Matt Beal and me up. So, you know, <laughs> that's that's wonderful. And Dr. Livia? I think I'm the last. I'm Maria Lavia. I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. I am the director of psychiatry at Equip Health, which is a virtual healthcare platform that treats individuals, ch children, adolescents, and young adults who struggle with eating disorders. Uh, we use family-based treatment for the younger children and CBTE for young adults. Thanks so much, Dr. Olivia. Really glad that you're here with us and, and really eager to learn from you as we delve into this topic. So I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then we're going to do a, a moderated discussion with our group of experts here. And then we're going to save the last segment of our time together for us to uh, really hear from you, from participants, from questions that you have. And we'll get to as many of the questions as we, as we can. So th this topic of how social media affects kids has been a subject of much discussion and debate between technologists and public health experts, researchers, public policy um, implementers, and from clinicians. And, and, and I'll say, you know, this is a group of clinicians here that are on our panel tonight. And I think clinicians have had the sense for quite a while that there's a real important understanding that we need to uh, to move forward and respect that we're hearing from kids and from parents and that we're seeing in our offices about the ways that social media 
is affecting kids' mental health. And this is a, a topic that's getting a lot of interest, and it's particularly gotten more interest in the last several weeks as the empirical evidence that's coming out from research that's being done is catching up to our clinical judgment and really catching up to intuition from parents about what they're seeing with their kids. And so if you, if you look at the slide that's shared here, I'll ask you to start with the graph on the right, which uh, is displaying the percentage of United States teens with major depression. So with really clinically significant depressive symptoms that require clinical intervention. And what you see is a really massive increase in rates of depression in both girls and boys over the last 10 years. Uh, this graph depicts from starting the, this really significant uptick starting around 2012, uh, 145% increase in girls and 160% increase in boys. And that, that increase continues to climb year over year over the last decade. And then I'll draw your attention to the graph on the left, which depicts the average time that people spend with friends, an average number of minutes each day spent with friends. And it's divided by age, and these age groups are by, really by decade of life. And the blue line depicts the decade between ages 15 and 24. And what you see is a precipitous decline in the time that young people are spending in person with their friends. So in the same room, in conversation, or in, in social activities with their friends over the last decade. And I, I think that many of us who have who work with kids every day and, and adolescents every day feel that this these two graphs are not coincidentally related. That the decrease in time spent with friends and spent in other kinds of activities is totally coincident with this increase in depression. And so it begs the question for why? What, what is going on? What are kids doing instead of spending time with their peers? And what are they doing that might be increasing the degree which they're experiencing depression? There's no question that there is a real and sustained crisis in adolescent mental health in our country. There was a survey that came out about four or five weeks ago that comes out every two years from the CDC that's called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, it summarizes a number of features of adolescent health, and it publishes this data every two years. And this report that came out several weeks ago was summarizing data over 10 years, from 2011 through 2021. So it included data through the first year and a half or so of the pandemic. And what this latest report found is that 57% of adolescent girls describe feeling uh, persistent, meaning daily or most days, feelings of sadness or hopelessness. And that was an increase from 36% in 2011. 36% is high, 57% is extraordinarily high. The survey found that 30% of adolescent girls now say that they've seriously considered suicide. And that was up from 19% 10 years prior. So we, we are seeing a picture of adolescents and particularly of adolescent females in really significant mental health crisis in emotional distress. And interestingly, despite what many folks thought might be the case, it doesn't seem as though COVID is the main culprit. If you look at the findings from the CDC data over the last decade, what you see is a very consistent trend year over year, adolescents experiencing persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, and these numbers reflect boys and girls together. 28 to 30 to 31 to 37 to 42, the trend is consistently upward over a decade, including prior to the pandemic. Seriously considering uh, uh, the uh, attempting suicide, again, persistently increasing year over year, making a suicide plan, attempting suicide, so all of these incredibly concerning data from the standpoint of public health certainly did increase during the pandemic, but they were on a significant uptick prior to the pandemic and the trend is only considered. So COVID is a, certainly a factor for the reasons that many of us have, have thought and, and talked so much about in the last few years, but it's not the main culprit. And there's mounting evidence that social media use really does contribute to emotional distress in many adolescents. What the, this, this photo on the right is, is the governor from Utah signing in a new piece of legislation at the end of last week 
seeking to limit the access of adolescents to social media without their parents' permission, to create a social media curfew overnight. This is new legislation. Um, it, it's going to be an ongoing story that will follow about how that is implemented in Utah and whether other states or jurisdictions may follow it as well. But certainly there are public policy responses that are emerging because there really is evidence that there are specific vulnerable populations, including potentially girls, including different kinds of social media use. So passive scrolling through social media, minute after minute, hour after hour, as opposed to more active and brief use that's used to connect with friends and to make plans. Um, adolescents with pre-existing mental health challenges may be particularly vulnerable. We're, we're seeing in increasingly consistent research that's coming out that rises in rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, and thoughts of suicide track closely with rises in social media use. And we all know from our own uses, and we're going to talk about our use as parents and adults as well, that these algorithms are finely tuned and designed to promote repetitive and sticky use of their platforms, to get people onto the platforms and to keep them onto their platforms as long as possible. So what we're going to do today is talk about the link between social media and young people. Uh, and their mental health. We're going to talk about some practical tools that we think parents and caregivers and educators and adults who care about young people can use to protect children in your life, and then address as many questions of yours that we can. So that's the that's a sort of an introduction to get us started. I'm going to uh, move next to, to posing some questions to our terrific panel here. And I hope that some of these questions will anticipate some of the, the thoughts that parents have or others that have on, on, on that are joining us today, but please do pose questions or thoughts that you have uh, in the Q&A section on Zoom so we can follow your thoughts. You know, it's natural, Dr. Kopowitz, for parents in every generation to worry. Every generation of parents thinks <coughs> technology that its children spend time with is harmful. Radio, television, video games, the, the culprit has changed over the years. There's reason to think that it might be different this time. Well, I think I think you nailed it. There's always something that disturbs the parent generation that the children are doing. Uh, comic books, uh, cartoons. I mean, there's always an enemy or a culprit to explain what the changes are. You know, the Beatles making music in a different way, Elvis Presley making music. However, here we have something to look at that is a little disconcerting. Um, when we start looking, I don't know if you can share the screen when we start talking about what social media does to your child, but if we can look at some data about US teens admitted to hospitals for non-fatal self-harm. So someone cutting, someone maybe taking some pills, but non-fatal. And if we look at that, here we go, we see that from 2004 to 2020, there has been an increase of a 40, uh, I'm sorry, 48% in just the, since 2010 for girls and for boys, a 37% increase. So just think about that. Hospitalization rates have jumped for non-fatal uh, self-harm for 15 to 19 year olds. Now, 15 to 19 year olds is that's smack in the middle of adolescence. That's when you see risk uh, minimize and opportunity maximize. Teenagers just see everything as a possibility and they don't think about the risk. So that's a pretty worthwhile and noteworthy uh, increase. But then if you look at US teens admitted to hospitals for non-fatal self-harm from ages 10 to 14, that's not as, remember, uh, suicide attempts, suicide completions are rarer in younger kids than in older kids. And here you see 188% inc increase since 2010 for hospitalizations for this young group and a 48% increase in boys. Now, we can't link this immediately and definitively to social media, but we have to think about what else has changed. When you start seeing these dramatic increases, has the water supply changed? Have the electrical currents in our telephone wires changed? What has changed? And the big difference, uh, definitely in our society, is that kids are getting a hold of iPhones much earlier in life. And so you're starting to see kids who are 10 or eight or six who are using social media all the time. And in the same way that many of us 
have this nervous habit of checking repeatedly to see if anything new has happened on our phone or anything new has happened in the news. Uh, this isn't good for kids. And, um, and while we can't tell you exactly what's happening to the brain, we do know that dopamine surges occur every time you get an email or a text, that you're getting validation in a way that's disconcerting, particularly for the developing brain. Not good for us with old brains. Old brains are really 24, and all, anyone who's more than 24 years old has an old brain, but nevertheless, much more dangerous for kids who have developing brains. Thanks so much, Dr. Kovalevich, and I, and I really appreciate the, the way that you tied the changes that are happening in kids' lives to our environment. I think that we have to think about environmental factors that are changing that might explain what's happening. I started off by saying that kids are spending much less time with their peers. When I say kids, forgive me, I'm talking about adolescents and teenagers and, and even young adults, less time with their friends. And what are they doing instead? A lot of them are spending time alone on their devices, in their rooms, or, or elsewhere uh, secluded. Lindsay, or Dr. Henderson, forgive me, I, I'd love to ask you for your thoughts about how we think about particular vulnerability. Is, is the vulnerability the same for all young people, or how do you think about which groups or which populations might be particularly vulnerable to the effects of social media? Yeah, so, I mean, the answer to that is that the same for everyone is always no, right? Um, each of our kids is different. I think all of us on this call, we're all parents. We understand the challenges ourselves for this topic. Um, so no, not everyone is at equal risk. Um, there, in, in the data that you guys have shown us so far, we've seen a significant difference between girls and boys. And I think that that's, you know, as a parent, what a, a first question, what is that all about? Um, I think Dr. Levita, you'll talk a bit more about this topic of like social comparison and just comparison in general, I imagine. Um, but girls seem to be a bit more prone to the comparison that comes with the use of social media. So feeling badly about myself because of what I see and compare myself to others that I am, you know, flooded with on social media. We can relate to that as adults, right? Um, that this person seems to be a great mother because they seem to have their act together and I don't. Um, so girls seem to be a bit more prone to that. Um, boys seem to be a bit more prone to um, the more high risk behaviors. So um, I think the percentage is, is, is generally lower for boys being at risk, but, the, but they are at risk for different things. So more of the high risk behaviors that you might see on social media, things like the Tide Pod challenge, right? Things like these challenges that seem you know, so silly to us with perfectly formulated frontal cortex, right? We're, we're just, but they are a bit more at risk at doing high, high risk um, behaviors. I think also what's important here is that kids, girls, boys, it doesn't matter what age or male, female, anywhere in between, um, kids who uh, struggle with impulsivity, um, who struggle with attention, who are, are going to be a bit more prone to that, like kind of suck into the algorithm, right? Um, the, the doom scrolling, the chronic use, the incessant use. Um, and then people who struggle with just emotion regulation and distress tolerance in general. So those kiddos that have what we like to call big feelings, who have feel things bigger, who have a harder time recovering from upset, um, who you know it takes a little longer to recover to get return to baseline. These are not bad things inherently, but there's skills that we're all faced to learn. Like how do we learn how to deal with our superpower of feeling things bigger than some other kids do? And these are the kids that are going to have trouble sort of tolerating what they see in in social media and the stuff that it brings up. Thanks so much. And I think we'll talk more about the, the, the ways that social media is really designed to tap into the way that our brains respond to reward. Dr. Koppel has talked about this a bit before, and it's really what drives addictive and repetitive behaviors. And I think that's the right framework with which to approach this question of what makes this so sticky, so difficult for teenagers to put down. So Matt, can we just take one minute where Lindsay was just talking about the prefrontal cortex? So for those of you who didn't take neuroscience, just very quickly, the part of your brain that's behind your um, your, temp, your uh, forehead is called the prefrontal cortex. And at about 25, it starts communicating to the rest of your brain. And it's that moment where we learn about cause and effect. 
so that if I don't wear a helmet while I'm riding a bicycle and I fall off the bicycle, I'm more likely to have a concussion. If I don't wear a condom, I'm more likely to get a venereal disease or get someone pregnant. Uh, if I don't put a seatbelt on and there's a car accident, I'm more likely to get hurt. And that's what I meant before when I was saying that adolescents love opportunity and don't think about risk. So thinking about what, how fluid and how spongy the brain is before we become 24 really shows us that social media has a different effect on the brains of teenagers than it does on, on adults. Thanks for that. I really appreciate that additional perspective there, Harold. And, and Dr. Lavia, as a, as a child psychiatrist who specializes in working with young people facing eating disorders, what is your perspective about what we know about the way that social media use affects self-image, body image, and self-esteem in young people? You're muted. This has been mentioned already today, but you know, social media exposes whomever is using it, whether it's kids or adults, to multiple images. And again, depending on whether you're a quick scroll or through, or you're actually going over and over and over through it. One of the things that Lindsay mentioned is that comparison, particularly in females. So if you're comparing yourself to things that you're seeing on social media, there's evidence that shows that, you know, hundreds of images of body images can shape size can be seen daily by these kids who are scrolling through. And those images lead to then expectations from that kid in terms of what their body image should now look like or how they might experience their body shape and size as compared to others. Um, adolescents who use social media for more than two hours a day are more likely to report body image concerns, body image issues, eating issues and eating concerns, as well as depression, which I think was mentioned earlier. And I think, you know, one of the things that we look at is, you know, where is the data? I, I don't know that we have tons of robust data at this point, but there are some preliminary studies that are showing a study done out of Australia looking at about a thousand seventh and eighth grade boys and girls that showed a clear pattern of association between the use of social media and disordered eating. And they looked at specific social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. So that's concerning. And then another study done in this country looking at a little bit older, but 19 to 32 year olds and seeing a link between social media use and eating concerns and body weight and shape concerns. So clearly there's some association and it makes sense based on what we're talking about. If you're looking and comparis making comparisons as you scroll through, you're going to start questioning, how do I look? How do I compare to this person? Um, and we all know that many of the body images that are portrayed on social media are not necessarily true representations. I think that's so true. And, and, and I, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, to interview Francis Haugen, who is the, the whistleblower who used to work at Facebook and, and is really concerned about the impact that Facebook and Instagram in particular having on young people. And she she talked about how the first 10 minutes that an, that an adolescent is on Instagram, they're seeing the feeds from their friends and their contacts. When they are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 minutes on, on Instagram, they have gotten very far away from their friends and they're getting to more and more extreme material and they start to get the material that includes extreme material about body image, extreme material about how to achieve certain body image results through extreme measures, ex dieting, restricting, purging. And the material starts to become extraordinarily distressing for adults who, who, who have a chance to see what their, what their kids are looking at. And it's really uh, a direct result of how these algorithms are designed to keep people looking and looking and looking and looking. And I, so I think the things that you're alluding to in terms of, of sort of what people find as they spend more and more time on these sites um, is so critical to producing the results that you described. So I appreciate you pointing all of that out. Uh, Lindsay, you know, I, I said at the outset that um, kids are spending less time with friends. 
And so, you know, one of the points of, of thinking about social media use is asking the question of when our kids are on social media more, what are they doing less of? What is it displacing? There's still only 24 hours in the day. There are still only eight hours outside of school where, where they're not sleeping. And hopefully they're sleeping, although we'll talk about sleep later. Um, and so um, it's it, social media may be dis displacing extracurricular activities, time with friends, but isn't don't kids tell us that they use social media to socialize and to connect with friends? Shouldn't they be feeling less lonely and more connected with all the time that they're spending on, on these platforms? Yeah, yes. And, you know, I think that there is um, certainly, we know that for, um, for, to a certain extent, to a certain use, and also for very specific kids, it, it, it is, it does help decrease loneliness, right? It helps maintain relationships that would drop off. And I think we as adults kind of probably experience that more so than our kids do. But for kids who are more socially isolated, who are um, marginalized, who are trying to figure out their identity in a place where they don't necessarily have people that look like them, sound like them, act like them, exist like them, feel like them, the loneliness does decrease because the connection can be you know, distributed. They can find like-minded folks who can be a lifeline. So I, I think one important takeaway here is that no one here is demonizing social media as a whole. We want to hold both sides here. Um, and so there is that good there. But Matt, you're right that, um, you know, as, as I think Harold's graph showed us that there's still this, this decreased time with friends, there's this decreased connection. And so that argument of like connecting with folks, it only goes so far. Um, I think that like the time that we spend in with any sort of technology, what is that taking away from? What are we doing? What are we losing? Is an important one. I also, you know, my gut feeling after years and years and years of this work is that I think um, that the prevalence of social media, but also just technology, just having a screen in your pocket at all times makes uh, the experience of loneliness more palpable or harder to tolerate. Um, when we, I mean, you know, I'm older, I'm not that old, but I'm old. Um, you know, I, I had to learn to tolerate the quiet. I had to learn to tolerate the moments in which I was alone with myself and my thoughts and my feelings and the quiet moments and the things that come up in those quiet moments. I do not think that kids with technology, whether it's social media or just watching a show or something with your, or being able to text a friend, you are uh, less skilled in practice at tolerating those moments of quiet, which I think then translate to, if I'm not with someone all the time, therefore I'm lonely. When really like all of us are, are you know, a, a life mission sort of an existential goal is to, to like ourselves, to like to be by ourselves, to, to like what comes up when we're when we're not distracted by others. So I don't know, Matt, that's sort of a gut uh, for years of watching kiddos like really um, it's, it's hard to sit with yourself when you don't like yourself. Right. And we don't allow them very much time to practice that at all. I think that's really really true i, I want to turn to back to you harold and, and talk the child mind institute has done such important work around raising awareness of bullying and i want to ask you what is the role that social media plays in bullying and cyberbullying in particular why, why are these two so closely linked you're still muted Harold. I think if we go back in time and remember before social media, that if you were in school and someone picked on you or someone was bullying you, it was a very discreet episode. Um, what happens with cyberbullying is, first of all, you don't necessarily know the person who's doing it to you. And more importantly, the audience becomes much larger. I, I like to think of it as you know, someone took your lunch money or someone pushed you against your locker. And not only do you know who did it so that you could tell the principal or you could tell your parents or you could avoid that person, but instead, everybody you know in school has seen the episode. Everyone you went to sleepaway camp, everyone that you know from your neighborhood now knows about it. So it gets magnified in a remarkable way. So that's number one. And also, it gives people permission to do things that if they had to do it to your face, they would take the risk of getting insulted back or getting physically assaulted back for, for doing it. And so we give people the chance to do things that they most probably wouldn't do 
if they had to face any kind of consequence. So uh, I think that this indirect communication is is problematic. And the the above point, by the way, has been made in lawsuits. So uh, a federal court in Oakland, California, uh, is arguing that in personal injury suits, um, that Meta is knowingly damaging children's mental health and suppressing that information. So they're saying disconnected, disconnected likes have replaced the intimacy of adolescent uh, friendships and that mindless scrolling uh, has displaced the creativity of play and sports. I mean, just think about how much effort it takes to draw a painting or to work on a ceramic piece or to participate in a sport by the way, that you're just okay at. So you spend a lot of time on the bench waiting or or you have to collaborate if you're playing soccer. And so a lot of those things disappear when you're spending more. But Matt, you said, what are they doing instead of being on the screen? Uh, well, they're on the screen, so they're not on the field or they're not in the studio. So I think that we have to really think about this as parents as to how we intervene in an appropriate way to counteract this. Because as you said, Meta and Instagram and all of them want your eyeballs and they want your eyeballs to stay. They don't want it just a fleeting, you know, right. one minute. You really want to see stickiness where a kid is spending 20 minutes, 100 minutes, 200 minutes. And, and we've done work on problematic Internet usage. And we can tell you that kids who spend six to eight hours on the Internet, if you have an underlying ADHD or a major depressive disorder, your symptoms will get worse. It's almost like marijuana and anxiety disorders. You're more at risk for a panic attack if you smoke marijuana, if you have anxiety. You are more at risk for significantly more depressive symptoms or more impulsivity and intention if uh, if you have ADD or depression and you're using uh, the internet in a problematic way. Absolutely, Harold. And, and, there, and, and there's emerging research, and this is the time for us to pivot to solutions. There's emerging research showing, uh, for example, a well-published study with college students that shows that a forced hiatus, obviously college students were agreeing to this forced hiatus, but a forced hiatus from social media for as little as two weeks significantly improves mood, improves sleep, increases social activities, um, improves a sense of hopefulness about the future. It has immediate positive effects when we put this stuff down. So Dr. Livia, let let, let's, let's start with you as we start to talk about solutions and things that parents and other adults who care about kids can do. We, we've talked about social comparisons. It's this inevitable thing that we do as humans, and social media is such a powerful social comparison tool. What can parents and other adults do to help children build a sense of self-esteem and confidence in themselves as an antidote or as a counterweight to this tendency toward social comparison? Yeah, I, I think there are are a lot of things. And even if we weren't dealing with the concept of social media, we as parents should be working to help our kids build self-confidence and bolster their self-esteem. There are many things that you can do, starting with um, looking at focusing on your children's strengths and really helping them build towards their strengths. Think about their weaknesses and maybe minimizing how you set up different things for your kids to do. Giving kids praise, not overly praising them. Don't praise everything that they do, but also don't save praise for specific outcomes. Praise them for the effort that they've put into something. Praise them for giving it their best shot. Praise them for being willing to step up to the plate and try something that they might be uncomfortable with. Um, I think teaching your children by showing them how to do something and then allowing them to do it and allow them to make mistakes. When they've made a mistake, then help them figure out, hey, what went wrong and what might I do differently the next time? Um, I think going along with praising is don't give harsh criticism. Don't really berate your child or really come down on them when they do something wrong or they do something incorrectly. Again, going back to what went wrong and how might we do this differently so next time you'd have a different outcome. Um, letting children help rather than doing everything for your children. Uh, and I also think that um, figuring out how we as parents can be role models, particularly as we're talking about social media. You know, I mean, I say this to my husband all the time, 
if you're on your phone at the table, you're setting an example for the kids that it's okay to be on your phone at the table, whereas table time is a great time to interact with your kids, socialize with your kids, find out what's going on with their day. Think about how much time we as parents spend on our screens, whether it's a television or a computer or our device in our hand, really setting that example for our kids and helping kids to find things that they enjoy outside of screen time and getting sort of sucked into this world. So I, I heard a, a really powerful definition of addiction, which was a new one for me. Um, and it was addiction is the narrowing of activities that give you pleasure, which I thought was really simple and powerful. And that's what I see in so many kids. And so Dr. Olivia, you're talking about get re-broadening the number of activities that give our kids pleasure. And I think the same applies to us. Uh, Harold and Lindsay, can I ask you to just, and first Harold and Lindsay, talk about some of the advice that you're giving the families that you work with about common sense rules, guidelines, family policies with regard to digital media and social media. So I think there's some basics that we use with most things with kids, and that's boundaries, resilience, and perspective. So we were just talking about what are you doing at dinner time? Do you as a family say, okay, everyone put their phones away? You know, you're, the president is not going to call. You know, you're not going to be, surgery is not about to happen. Someone else is on call. And so you take the phones away. And by the way, I'm not asking for an hour. Take the phones away for 20 minutes. And the other thing that you have to do is the idea of the resilience is that you do feel the loss of that phone. If you've been looking at it all day long and now for 20 minutes you're in withdrawal, you have to help your kids. And one of the things you have to help your kids with is having a conversation. I mean, the art of a conversation, it, you know, I remember as a teenager really enjoying talking to a girlfriend. I mean, it really gave me a tremendous amount of pleasure to be on the telephone and talking to her about her feelings and my feelings and what was going on. But sometimes our kids need some instruction. And the way you do that is modeling. So that if you're going to sit at the table, you know, maybe sometimes you just go around the table and say, you know, why do you feel lucky today? And everyone talks about why they feel lucky. And if they feel unlucky, it's got to be something serious. Or why do you feel happy, even though I can never tell you the difference between happy and lucky. But the other thing that, you know, you talk to little kids about, four, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, is you questions. You know, ask three you questions of the person to your right. You know, where did you, what did you learn in school today? What did you do after school? You know, where did you get that sweater? And that teaches kids that conversations are based on reciprocity and that most people do like talking about themselves. And so that if you ask those three you questions to your right and then three you questions to your left and three you questions to the person across from you, there's a very good chance that someone's going to get the idea that they should ask you some questions also. But I think that not only do most kids need that instruction, but now they need it more than ever because they are having these very unusual conversations with kids. It could be a text, it could be a text back, then it could be hours before they get the text again so that they have lost the ability to follow a conversation and get it to become deeper and more rewarding. Yeah, great points, Harold. I think to add just two other points to add to that, which I think is, I'm just saying this in a new way, but this idea of teaching our kids moderation. Um, so nothing, all, you know, is inherently good or bad, right? We want to teach moderation, whether that is candy, whether that is screen time, whether that is alcohol for our older teens and young adults. We want to both talk about it, teach it, and then also model it. And um, an all or nothing approach rarely works um, unless moderation, you've really found out that, you, that it doesn't work, right? So, um, you know, we alluded to the addiction kind of analogy or model and, and um, you know, for some moderation is impossible, but let's really give it a shot. Let's really teach it, model it, talk about it um, on all, all, all points. Um, but then also, I think the other thing is like at, at, a certain age is how do you start talking to your kids about reflecting the way that their screen time makes them feel? So this is something that is hard for adults. It's hard for, we're all mental health professionals right here and we don't necessarily do this for ourselves, right? So that external like, hey, how did it feel to sort of get online, 
look at something for 20 minutes and log off? Or, you know, how did it feel? Like, what, what's it like to stay online for two hours? You know, like starting to make a, a connection between cause and effect. Uh, we all need help with that. And how do we start talking to our kids about that um, to develop a more like kind of inherent, you know, um, like self-driven kind of moderation and control? Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, I'm, we're going to get to the to the participants' questions in a moment. Dr. Olivia, anything you'd add about specific guidelines or recommendations or advice you give to, to families? I think one of the things is is sort of piggybacking, I think, on what Lindsay was saying is these kids are going to grow up and become adults. And so we really need to learn how to help them moderate for themselves. You can set all the limits you want. Oh, the phone needs to be downstairs, plugged in, in the kitchen, at the charging station. But they need to figure out how to go off into the world and manage their use of these devices as well as hopefully we do as the adults role modeling for them. So I think the importance is giving age appropriate guidelines as kids move along their developmental trajectory so that you're giving them some feedback, also talking to them, as Lindsay said, about, well, what was that like? You know, how is it to plug yeah. your phone in downstairs? Those kinds of things. I think that's I think that's so important. And, and I, I think we, we can't expect an 11 year old to self-monitor effectively, nor does it make sense to be saying to a 17-year-old, give me your phone, it's time to plug it in. Like somewhere along that developmental trajectory, there needs to be some ownership that, that takes place among young people. And, and that's our job to provide that, that scaffolding. I wanna make a couple of brief points and then get to questions. I'm, I'm gonna to try to summarize some of the incredible questions that are in the, in the Q&A. Um, I wanna to speak to a couple of things quickly. One is, video games, particularly interactive video games versus social media. And so I think that there is some emerging evidence and I'll, you'll keep hearing us say emerging evidence because the evidence is new, but there is emerging evidence that not, not all media use is the same. We, we, doom scrolling is the, or passively scrolling through social media, not interacting, not having personal relationships with the content that you're looking with is probably the most deleterious, the most toxic for young people. Brief use that involves connecting with friends, having conversations that are dynamic and back and forth in real time is probably much better than that. That would be sort of considered active use of social media. Playing video games, particularly playing video games that are interactive, um, that where people are playing with their friends and there's conversation that's happening and it's dynamic and has a social aspect to it is probably better as well. Um, there's there's a lot of reasons to think that, in, including evidence from research. All of that with the caveat of going back to what Harold said earlier, if it's happening for six or eight hours a day, it's too much no matter what it is. And of course, the average use among teenagers in the United States is about seven hours a day. So there's way too much of this happening. And there's we can't explain that away by saying, well, this kind is OK. Video games are OK or they're communicating with friends. If it's an hour or two versus six or seven hours, that's a huge difference. And that gets me to the second point I wanna make, which is about displacement. We, talk, we talked about social media use displacing friend time. Social media use also displaces sleep. And young people need to sleep. Young brains need sleep. Elementary and middle school age kids need 10 hours of sleep a night on average. Kids in high school need nine hours of sleep a night. Certainly more than eight hours of sleep a night. And that's much less, I'm sorry, that's much more than the average high school student gets. And a lot of that is because of media use. Um, and so it's displayed when, when kids are on platforms, when they're on Instagram or Snapchat at 11 p.m. or midnight or 1 a.m. and they're not sleeping, what that looks like when you show up in one of our offices is it looks like a depressed mood. It looks like inattention. It looks like irritability. When kids are underslept, when kids are chronically underslept, it starts to take on the clinical characteristics of mental illness. Sleep is so critically important for young people and we can't let social media displace it. So let me get to some of these questions and, and Lindsay, Harold, uh, Maria, please jump in if, you, if you've got an, an answer ready. Um, how do you control or monitor your kids use of social media when so many other parents aren't putting any restrictions on their kids? They, you, they, I get the, I don't wanna feel left out complaint from kids. So so. How, how do you think about that? Please jump in. 
I think that's a tough one. I mean, I, I have kids of my own who have made that same argument. And part of it is, honestly, I talk to them about why I'm imposing limits and why it makes sense. So really being honest with them about my daughter, my 16 year old says, why do you always say, well, data shows. <laughs> and I said, because sometimes I think you need to understand that I'm making these decisions based on real world evidence, not just because your mom thinks this is how it should be. So explaining to kids why you're setting the limits that you're setting and how you're helping them to learn how to set these limits later is really an important part of helping your children understand why the limits are important. I think it's also a great way to show your kids how to think about something, that it's not just your gut feeling, it's not just because your friend is doing it, but that you you know that anyone who watched this program today um, decides that they can say to their child, I did hear that there's some evidence that it affects your brain more than it would affect my brain. I do know that if you, you know, if you have ADD, you really have to monitor this more carefully than if you didn't have ADD. It's not fair, but it's not fair when people have diabetes and they can't eat the way everyone else does. So they have to monitor how much exercise they have versus how much they're eating. So I think that's a great, I think, I love the fact that you're saying, not only am I telling you how I'm thinking, but I want you to start you know, that's a great model for how they should think. I think the only thing to add there is like us as parents tolerating that we can, we can control our kids, we can control our, control our kids to an extent, we can control our household to an extent, we can model things and they will go out into the world and we have to trust them and empower them to make good choices. And that's hard to sit with as parents. So some of it's on us, I think. I would I, I I'd add to that really good information the the encouragement to parents to to get together with other parents in your communities and there are questions about this in the chat if you if you've got a child who's in second grade this is coming for you so this this decision point and this dilemma so talk to the other parents in the second grade classroom and start to share conversations about priorities and values and there it it gets a lot easier if kids in a cohort start to, to have similar sets of expectations. We're not gonna sort of tell our fellow parents what to do and what to decide in their household, but having open conversations about it, you'll find that so many parents are worrying and wondering about this too. And there's great courage that comes from doing something in, in, in with a sense of, of solidarity among your peers. It's true for us as parents and it's true for our kids as well. So starting to have these conversations early and I'll say this to even those of you whose kids are older, whose kids are in middle school or high school, getting to know your children's friends' parents is very, very important and very powerful, even as your kids are, are in entering adolescence and they, the, your parent, your kids don't want you in their lives and they don't want you to know anything about their, about their friends. The kids that they're spending time with, get to know those kids' parents and talk to them about your concerns and about how things work in your house. And you'll start to get a sense of a, a little bit more of a ability to, as Lindsay said, to sort of say, I, you know, I'm in control here. And while you're under my roof, I'm going to do the things that I think are, are healthiest for you. I'm going to make mistakes and I don't know everything, but this is, this, this is something that I think is really important. And I think, you know, really, really sort of standing up against that and, and partying with your kids and, and not and making decisions with your kids that aren't popular. Um, that's obviously a really important part of parenting as well. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to, to another question again. Forgive, forgive us for not being able to get to it enough. I hope that you as participants have a chance to read through the questions that are being posed. So, L Lindsay, this is picking up on one of the comments I think that you made earlier. And this participant asks, in addition to not tolerating the quiet, what do you think about what screens are doing to creative thought, to thinking for yourself, to problem solving? Harold, you spoke about conversational skills. Uh, I, I would add to just the ability to play. Doesn't this create more helplessness and lack of coping in daily life? And, I'll, and and turning it towards the positive, what can we do to create more opportunity for creativity and play in kids' lives? Again, as a counterbalance to this tendency to sort of just be on the phone. What an interesting question. Um, I think that this gets to what all of us here practice, which is um, you know the, the the foundations of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what we know, like our our thoughts, our our talk track internally impacts the way that we feel. 
the way that we think and feel. And so if your talk track is getting sort of um, downloaded to you from external sources, you've got to question those sources. Um, and so I think I, that's honestly something I hadn't thought about. So wonderful question. Like what, what are, what are our kids getting downloaded into them that kind of runs on a loop on autoplay without even realizing it. Um, I will also say, I want to make a plug here for the fact that I have observed, you know, as a adolescent professional here that I do think that the generations are getting more tolerant, more welcoming, more inclusive, more positive in general of one another. Um, you know, as a broad sweeping statement, I think that um, this is a pretty cool generation that we're raising in many, many ways. Um, they celebrate individuality and acceptance. Um, and so hopefully that is going to be part of that talk track that comes through. Um, but I think, you know, so one of these questions was like, my kids are on, on a laptop all day at school, and then they come home and they do their, their homework on a laptop, and then they relax on screen. And you know what? The same is true for me. So um, like, how do we combat that? How do we look for opportunities to detach? So we may not be able to change that. We may not be able to change the fact that schools operate this way. How do we look for opportunities to detach and unplug as a family um, to encourage creativity with literally boxes of things that you do with your hands and not on screen. Um, I don't know what my colleagues have to add to that question, but it's a, it's a great one. I, I, th I think that we absolutely need to model it, like you said, Lindsay, and I think that we need to limit the time the kids have access and kids will find time. It's okay to be bored. Um, it's okay to uh, not really know what to do. And we, particularly when the kids are younger, building that capacity for filling up the filling up the time with other kinds of activities is critical because it's we're we're drawn to it like moths to the flame. And think about the activities that you spend time with as a family. You know, I think I know this may be a topic for you, Dr. Olivia. I know that 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 um, folks interested in nutrition really really emphasize it with young kids not treating sweets as sort of the ultimate reward um, is a very important way to shape healthy eating across the lifespan. I think similarly as families, how we use our time. And if, fam if all of your precious family time is a rush to the screens, um, that's sending a really strong message to kids as opposed to finding other kinds of time to spend together as a family, I think it is a really powerful model as well. Anything you'd add, Maria? Yeah, you know, I think to, to sort of add to that, thinking about even meal time being a time, I think as Harold said, to get rid of the phone, but also a time to be mindful about what you're eating. You know, be mindful about the food, the conversation. Eating is a social event. You know, this is when we get to interact with other people. And so many families these days are rushing off here and there to multitudes of things. And often kids are left at home in front of their screen. You know, one of the things that we talk in, about in the world of eating disorders is really being mindful when you're eating. So not being glued to the television or glued to your phone for lots of reasons. Um, including the fact that it's really hard to pay attention to hunger and fullness cues when you're down a rabbit hole on your phone or in a show or a movie. So I think that being able to sort of think about other things, as Lindsay said, that you can do to sort of fill time and fill space and think about things that, you know, 10 or 15 years ago even were things that we just thought of as kind of commonplace parts of our life that have been taken over by screen time. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. So th there's another question I wanted to, to share, which is what role do you see pediatricians having in addressing the pediatric mental health crisis through depression screenings, through some other uh, efforts that pediatricians can play? I wonder, Harold and, and Lindsay, if you might speak to that and also speak to the role that Fort Health is trying to play. I certainly think that pediatricians are the most, they're the first line of defense in this army. Uh, if, we're, if we have a war on mental health disorders in children, pediatricians are the people that we come to on a yearly basis at least. Uh, and while they may not know us as well as the experience you'll have with a the therapist, they see you year in and year out. 
And I certainly think that pediatric screeners, you know, that when you come to your pediatrician's office, it seems common sense to me that you should have a mental health screen once a year in the same way that people check your vision and your hearing. But I also think that the whole idea of collaborative care, the fact that pediatricians do recognize that the most common illnesses of childhood and adolescence are mental health disorders. They're not infectious disease. And unfortunately, most pediatricians who are in practice today didn't get much training in how to identify or treat mental health disorders. So the idea that we could collaborate with them in the way that Ford Health has been doing in that you can have a, the pediatrician can get instant, almost curbside consultation from a mental health professional, in particular a child psychiatrist, if medications involved, or from a mental health professional, if it's just some counseling, some parent, uh, parent training, that I think is a very unique model that Ford Health is pioneering and is really being able to maximize the role of the pediatrician as well as the shortage that we have in mental health professionals for child mental health. Carol, thank you. Lindsay, can you share a little more about what collaborations between mental health professionals and pediatricians can look like? Sure. So, I mean, as Harold said, pediatricians are, you know, the front line, really. And so how do we, you know, our, our um, colleagues and incredibly talented, you know, partners at Equip, um, you guys are doing the same thing, right, where we're trying to meet people where they're at. We're using, now here we are, we are telehealth companies, right, talking about the dangers of screen time. So this is like a very good dialectic here, a model of how both can be true, how we can break down barriers and make things more accessible using technology, and there has to be a limit to what is not so great about technology. So I think any sort of um, effort and um, commitment to communication between pediatricians, parents, and children or teenagers is just like where we, at our three organi organizations are just so focused on this. Like, how do we make this commonplace? How do we make it easy for all parties? How do we make it comfortable and beneficial? Um, the last the last thing we want to do is add to the burden that healthcare professionals across the board already experience and that are burning them out from this field. And so, you know, I think all of us on this call are really committed to how are we doing this in a streamlined way that um, is is not additive to what we're already expected to do, but it is really like a, a true benefit. And I want to say that like to parents too, don't come away from this thinking, oh my God, now I need to do more. That is not the goal here. I think thinking about things in bite-sized chunks, finding a, ten, a magic 10 minutes where you see your kid's eyes light up in something that's other than, than technology, that's enough. That is enough. You know, this is not a lecture on what to do more or differently. It's just about finding the little ways that we can light up life in a different non-technology way. And that's that's all that's all your challenge is, is to find little moments and not to feel overwhelmed by yet another kind of impossible parenting task. And that can happen during carpool, that can happen when you're baking cookies, that can be happening when you're setting the table or cleaning dishes. Absolutely. That's, that's I think I think that this reminder that uh, the, the fact that we're also concerned about this and so attuned to it doesn't mean we have to go out tonight and fix it. Um, it means that we can elevate our level of curiosity about it. We can look for moments of connection with our kids. We can start with our own behavior. Um, we can make sure that when we take our kids to the doctor that we're talking about their mental health and about their sleep and asking for advice about how to manage social media use. Talk to your friends about it. Talk to your your aunties about it. Talk to people whose advice you trust, um, and and make this part of the conversation in your community. And it will help all of us. There is a network effect that happens when we all decide that something is important, and we want to bring our attention to us. And and that's really what we're trying to drive. Um, the, the, it's not just the social media giants that get to have network effects. We get to have them too, as citizens and as parents with one another. And that's what we're really trying to build here. We're enormously grateful for the participation. Uh, we, I, I'm sorry we couldn't get to 98% of the questions. They were wonderful. There was a wonderful dialogue happening in the, in the discussion as well. Look for more events like this from the Child Mind Institute and Fort Health and Equip Health because this is something that we want to continue to collaborate on. And uh, we hope you all ha ha have a good evening and that you uh, set your phones aside when you walk into the house tonight. Let's give it a shot. Thank Thanks you all. all. Thank you. Thank you.